Hello and welcome to our HIPAA Business Associates under High Tech Training with Omnibus Rule Update. My name is Carlos Leva. I am the CEO of Three Lions Publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Today's training agenda is as follows. We're going to review learning objectives. We're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at who is a business associate. And then we're going to turn our attention to the High Tech Act and Omnibus Rules business associate implications with respect to the security rule, the privacy rule, and the breach notification rule. Next, we're going to spend some time talking about the business associate covered entity contractual requirements, which now include contractual requirements between a business associate and a subcontractor as well. And then finally, we're going to close with a summary of the omnibus rule that impacted uh, business associates, really a summary of what we've covered throughout the today's training, and then, and then we're going to turn it over to Q&A. Obviously, if you're taking this class as part of an organizational requirement, your QA will be with your privacy officer, security officer, and or with the sponsor of the class. So our learning objectives for today's training is as follows. We want to provide a foundational understanding of the High Tech Act's impact on business associates by reviewing, one, who qualifies as a business associate, two, business associate compliance with the privacy, security, and breach notification rules, and liability regarding same, and we're going to include in all that the omnibus rule, because the omnibus rule really impacted these other rules. Three, we're going to discuss BA contracts and the covered entities required due diligence, and also now a business associate's required due diligence with respect to subcontractors. And then again, we're going to uh, encapsulize all this by looking at an omnibus rule summary of business associate implications. The net net is that we want to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of how your HIPAA compliance initiative may need to be revised under the High Tech Act due to the changing relationships with the parties. We also want to prepare attendees for a short quiz on the material covered in order to certify attendance. That is, if your organization has chosen to use the quiz for this purpose. So we like to think of the High Tech Act as being a container of a three-legged stool with the HIPAA privacy rule comprising one leg, the HIPAA security rule comprising the next leg, and the High Tech breach notification, because the breach notification rule was introduced under High Tech, is the third and final leg. And around the stool, there are other uh, niche areas like social and mobile, but you got to get the foundation in place first before you can start focusing on these niche areas. Cloud is uh, would be another one. They're important, but without the foundation in place, they're really a misguided effort, at least to start with. So the omnibus rule was published on the Federal Register on January 25, 2013. It went into effect March 26, 2013. It encompasses the privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification rule, and the enforcement rules. Now, you need to understand that a lot of these rules, breach notification and enforcement, there were interim final rules that were already law. So the omnibus rule really just wrapped it up and uh, promulgated the final rules. Okay, but that doesn't mean that this is where enforcement started. Enforcement started with the interim final rules. Unfortunately, the term interim is a is a misnomer because that is good law. Okay, so the net net is that covered entities and business associates have 180 days to comply with the omnibus rule, but the om but 95% of the rules were already in effect. It's only the 5% or so new regulations that was introduced by the omnibus rule that you get this 180 days grace period to comply. So that's a key takeaway from today's training is the omnibus rule really was 95% uh, already in effect. The 5% is, is uh, important and we're going to cover it today, uh, but that is what you have 180 days really to come into compliance with. Anytime you see an orange hand, this is going to indicate a change introduced by or an example provided by the omnibus rule. Now, we're going to flag a lot of omnibus rule changes. Some of them are covered in more depth in our other training modules, like our breach uh, notification training module, our privacy rule training module. But we're going to uh, highlight them here because of the impact they have on business associates. So to be clear, everything in the omnibus rule really came out of the High Tech Act. The omnibus rule is not uh, the transformative piece of regulation. The transformative piece of legislation was the High Tech Act. 
the the omnibus rule is the finalization of HHS rules that all emanate from the High Tech Act. So let's quickly, just so that we set the stage, the High Tech Act was the statute, the omnibus rule, uh, the enforcement rule, the breach notification rules, those were rules, the updates to the privacy rule and the updates to the security rule, those were rules that HHS promulgated in support of the High Tech Act. So Section 13401 says application of security provisions and penalties to business associates of covered entities. Business associates must now comply with the security rule. 13402, notification in the case of breach. Business associates are now on the hook for notifying in the case of breach. 13404, and I'm only summarizing those pieces that really touch business associates because obviously that's, that's today's training module. 13404, application of privacy provisions and penalties. The business associate between 13404 and 13401, the net net is business associates and their subcontractors now are on the hook for complying statutorily with the security rule and with the privacy rule. That really is the, 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 the takeaway here. 13408, business associate contracts required for certain entities will review uh, what those entities are, and 13410 improve enforcement, and 13411 both apply to business associates, and they both apply to subcontractors of business associates. So, one of the key topics that we want to cover today is who is a business associate? Well, the business associate definition was changed under the omnibus rule, uh, and we're just going to cover the highlights here and what changed, but uh, what stayed the same was any person or entity that creates, receives, maintains, or transmits PHI for a function or activity regulated by this subchapter on behalf of a covered entity is going to be a business associate. That's the, that, that's the foundational definition. So this person or entity provides other than in the capacity of a member of the workforce. So obviously your employees or other members of your workforce are not business associates but that other than the capacity of a member of the workforce provide services such as legal actuarial accounting consulting data aggregation management administrative accreditation we're going to go through a lot more all on behalf of a ce where that business function provided by this entity requires the use of phi that is the key concept here if the business partner requires the use of the covered entity or now the sub the business associates PHI, then that entity is going to be a business associate by definition. Now a covered entity may be a business associate of another covered entity. Business associates includes, and this is right out of the High Tech Act, health information organization, e-prescribing gateways, or other person or entity that provides data transmission services with respect to PHI to a covered entity or a business associate, and that requires access on a routine basis to such PHI. Now, there's a, a distinction here being made uh, between these organizations that I would sort of characterize in, the, in, in, in meaningful use terms as interoperability organizations, and the, their BAs by definition, because the High Tech Act specifies them as BAs and other conduits that we're going to get to later, which there's a conduit exception for ISPs, wireless networks, and those aren't business associates. So this is this is a key concept. These interoperability data transmission providers are business associates. Also, a business associate is a person or entity that offers a PHR, a personal health, health record, to one or more individuals on behalf of the covered entity. So if Microsoft Health Vault is attached to the covered entity's EHR, then Microsoft would be a business associate of that covered entity. And finally, under the omnibus rule, a subcontractor of a business associates that, cre that creates, receives, maintains, or transmits PHI on behalf of the business associate. A business associate does not include, so it, it, it's important to know who, who is in and who's out, okay? Otherwise, you can easily uh, lose track of the forest for the trees. A healthcare provider 
with respect to disclosures by a covered entity, the healthcare provider concerning the treatment of the individual is not a business associate. So if one provider refers you to another provider, that next provider is not a business associate because they're a covered entity, they're excluded. A plan sponsor with respect to disclosures by a group health plan or by a health insurance uh, issuer or HMO with respect to a group health plan, not a business associate. A government agency with respect to determining eligibility for or enrollment in a government health plan is not a business associate. Business associate also does not include a covered entity participating in an organized health care arrangement. Now, these are complex arrangements that are allowed. We're not going to go into it in, in much detail, but this is another exclusion. Most uh, covered entities that are participating in these complex arrangements are well aware of the, their ramifications and that they are not included as a BA. So to summarize, a few examples. Any third party, and this came right out of the omnibus rule, and HHS made this very clear in the omnibus rule. Any third party that stores or maintains PHI on behalf of a CE, and when I say on behalf of a CE, you can also read or BA, okay? Any third party that stores or maintains PHI on behalf of a CE, so examples are electronic health record vendors, cloud storage vendors, Microsoft Office 365, Amazon S3, Google Drive, all of these vendors would be business associates and business associate contracts would be required. Now, BA does not include a third party that merely provides a conduit for transmission of PHI. So you can think of this as a pipeline where PHI is passing, but it's never stored or maintained. That is an internet service provider and wireless service providers. Those are pure pipelines for PHI. Nothing is stored or maintained. Those are not business associates by definition. Also, as per HHS guidance, a BA does not include a third party whose contact with PHI is incident to the business function performed, housekeeping, landscaping, etc. The covered entity or the business associate does not propose to share PHI with these entities. However, these entities may come into contact incident to their responsibilities. They are not business associates by definition. Obviously, this has implications with respect to who you train who you have business associate contracts with, who you have to perform due diligence on, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So business associate, this term, as, as we've seen, has broad applicability and includes partners wherein the product or service provide, provided requires the disclosure of protected health information. That's the key concept. The, private, the product or service provided requires the disclosure of protected health information. This is right out of the regulations. It's just a review. It includes accountants, consultants, lawyers, EHR vendors, PHR vendors, software vendors, etc. What's the so what? Well, the late relationships between a covered entity and a BA must be contractual via a written contract, and that contract has to conform to certain statutory requirements. That is, if the product or service provided requires the, the disclosure of PHI. Obviously, if it doesn't require the disclosure of PHI, then that entity is not a BA by, de by definition. So what a high tech has done is significantly increases the number of cooks in the compliance kitchens. We have BAs now directly liable statutorily for the privacy rule and the, and the security rule and the breach notification rule that was un introduced under high tech. And we have subcontractors of BAs also statutorily liable because we use this term subcontractors of BAs but a subcontractor of a BA is just another BA. So protected health information changed under the omnibus rule. Genetic, uh, the, the definition changed because the underlying definition of health information changed. Uh, and so PHI now includes uh, genetic information and it now excludes the PHI of anyone who's been deceased for more than 50 years. And uh, just as a warning, that, that doesn't mean that a covered entity or a business associate has to maintain PHI uh, for death plus 50 years. In fact, there are no requirements in the regulations for duration of maintaining uh, 
PHI. That is a business decision that each covered entity and business associate has to make on their own. Uh, actually, it's more the responsibility of the covered entity. I would say, you know, a common sense uh, period of time, maybe 10 years. Okay, so protected health information means individually identifiable health information that's transmitted by electronic media, maintained in electronic media, or transmitted or maintained in any other form or medium, paper or electronic, with a few minor exceptions. The definition of PHI is quite broad. So business associates that you might have, administrative, purchasing, security, facilities, um, accounting, actuarial, consulting, a lot of these business associates you already have in place and you probably didn't realize that they were business associates uh, like your CPA or your attorney. And because they're business associates, you're now required to have business associate contracts with these entities. Now, software vendors. Now, the mere selling or providing of software to a covered entity does not give rise to a business associate relationship. If the vendor does not have access to the PHI of the covered entity, on a regular basis. If the vendor does need to access the PHI of the covered entity in order to provide its service, the vendor would be a BA of the covered entity. Now, many of you may be thinking, well, uh, and it's clear, it's obvious that any cloud-based EHR vendor is going to be a business associate because they have control of the PHI. But as it turns out, even if you're hosting the application locally and your software provider provide support and provides individuals that dial in and ha help you troubleshoot application issues and database issues, you're going to have to have a business associate relationship with that entity because they do um, access PHI for their business function on a regular basis. So, for example, a software company that hosts a software containing patient information on its own server or accesses Patient information when troubleshooting the software function is a BA of the CE or the BA. So you can always uh, read into or the BA. Now, in these examples, a CE would be required to enter into a BA agreement before allowing the software company access to the PHI. There's a software vendor exception. However, when an employee of a contractor, like a software information technology vendor, has his or her primary duty station on site they live in your building they're on site on, on your premises then the ce may choose to treat that that employee the vendor as a member of the ce's workforce and as we've already discussed members of a ce's workforce are not business associates so there is a, uh, an exception if you have someone uh permanently on site not business associates, docs, nursing services, lab services, radiology, physical therapy, occupational therapy. Why? Because these are all providers and these are all people that a covered entity may interact with, may exchange PHI with, but that exchange is for the treatment of the individual. So all these entities would fall under the treatment exception and would not be considered business associates. Couriers, the privacy rule does not require a covered entity to enter into a business associate contract with organizations such as the U.S. Postal Service, UPS, FedEx, certain private couriers and their electronic equivalents that act merely as a conduit. So we talked about conduits, your ISP, your wireless provider, that those are conduits for uh, electronic EPHI. You can have conduits for paper PHI. In either case, these conduits these couriers these pipelines are not considered to be business associates of the covered entity now uh, for more information hhs has provided who are business associates guidelines and anywhere you see a url in these slides you can usually click through either to the hipaa survival guide or to some other reference site where you can get additional information not clear to me that this has been updated since the omnibus rule but in general, HHS has done a pretty good job of updating and maintaining their documentation on its site. So uh, it would not surprise me if it has now been updated. Also, not business associates, janitorial companies. We already talked about that. 
Why? Because they do not involve the user disclosure of PHI. Any access to protected health information by such persons would be incidental to their business function, and therefore they would not be considered business associates. So where are you going to look for business associates? One place to look is all the touch points related to a patient's EHR and all the touch points where you send and receive PHI. Okay, some of them are going to be um, excluded because they're providers and you're exchanging PHI for treatment purposes. Others are going to be included because you're exchanging PHI for billing services, for storage, for backup, etc. So one place to look is at the PHR, uh, at, at your touch points, and, and, and in particular your EHR's touch points, but there are other uh, touch points as well, storage vendors uh, for uh, paper records, etc., etc. There are a lot more business associates than you are probably aware of. So what's the liability? Well, the privacy rule uh, and the security rule does not require a covered entity to actively monitor the actions of its business associate, nor is the covered entity responsible or liable for the actions of its business associate, with some caveats that we're going to talk about. Rather, the rule only requires that where a CE knows of a pattern or activity or practice that constitutes a material breach or violation, then the BA uh, of the BA's obligation under the contract, the CE must take steps to cure the breach or end the violation. Now, there's been some uh, slight modifications here, but that's still a general rule. There, there's no 24/7, obviously, monitoring of a business associate's um, operations. You, the the essence of the rule is rule. You can't look the other way. If you know that the business associate, uh, and now under the High Tech Act, if the BA knows that the covered entity is in material breach of the contract, then they have a duty, an affirmative duty to take some action. Now, when when we say that a BA is not responsible, or a covered entity is not responsible for, or liable for the actions of its BAs, there are some exceptions that we're going to talk about. One exception is the agency ex exception. Another exception uh, not directly under high tech HIPAA, but in a class action lawsuit where a covered entity or a business associate did not do sufficient due diligence on its partners, uh, some clever law firm will probably make the argument that an, a, negligence, a negligence argument under state law and obviously liability could attach there. Uh, so in addition now, under the high tech 13404, a business associate is now required to monitor a covered entity's compliance with the contract. And going one step further, a subcontract, a business associate must monitor uh, the subcontract, uh, subcontractor contract, uh, as convoluted as that sounds, and the subcontractor has to monitor the contract as well. So you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen and a lot of eyes on the ball. So the covered entity business relationship. And the corresponding requirements and potential liability, uh, it's created because of the sharing of PHI and not because of the fact that a BA agreement exists. So the minute you start sharing PHI with a partner so that that partner can perform a business function on your behalf, that relationship, that relationship springs into being and the ensuing duties and responsibilities do as well. So here's what it looks like from a, a diagram perspective. You have a covered entity that has uh, business associate relationships one, two, three through N. Each business associate has subcontractor one through subcontractor N. A covered entity is not required to do any due diligence on subcontractors. That's the responsibility of the business associate. Okay, and a subcontractor could likewise have subcontractors and the business associate would not be responsible. So everyone is responsible for their direct next level of business associates. Now we talked about the agency exception and the agency relationship, and this has to do uh, in, an in an important critical sense with breach notification. Now, and we're gonna talk about what, how you establish a, a, an agency relationship and really why you don't want an agency relationship but with respect to notification uh, 
if a breach occurs in an information system controlled by a business associate, then the business associate discovers the breach. They have 60 days to notify the covered entity. And then subsequent to that, the covered entity has 60 days to notify patients, HHS, and media, depending on certain conditions, patients always having to be notified. If there's an agency relationship, the knowledge of the agent is imputed to the knowledge of the principal, and the CE is deemed to have discovered the breach at the same time that the BA did, and therefore there's a total of 60 days to notify. Okay, and so that's a critical difference uh, that needs to be understood. Now we're going to talk about what um factors go into establishing an agency relationship just so that you kind of get a feel for how that works so <clears throat> whether the parties consider the the ba to be an agent of the covered entity or not is not relevant to the ultimate determination of agency the courts will use the federal law of agency to make this determination and the u.s supreme court has given uh, certain factors that need to be considered. Now, at the end of the day, at the end of the analysis, if you wanted to summarize uh, where these factor lead, where these factors lead, it's trying to de the determination is how much control does one party have over the other. If one party has absolute control, economic control usually over the other, then they're likely going to be deemed an agent of the first party. And I'll give you a, a, a sort of crude example, but it will help you see. If you have your brother-in-law, you're in a small practice, your brother-in-law uh, is a CPA, uh, but you provide your brother-in-law, he's not a member of your workforce, he doesn't work for the practice, but you provide your brother-in-law 100% of his business. You tell him... Um, what hours he has to work, uh, what tools he has to use, etc. You have complete economic control, then your brother-in-law would likely be considered an agent of your practice. And there's a whole lot of things that attach to that um, because principals are responsible for their, um, you know, for the acts of their agents. But one of them is breach notification. So. The Supreme Court in Community um, for Creative v. Reed, 1989 case, gave this series of factors to look at. Probably if you're going through this analysis, you're going to need counsel to help you make that determination, but we'll just go over a few of them. The hiring party's right to control the manner and means by which the work is accomplished, the skill required to accomplish the work, the source of instrumentalities and tools, the location, the duration of the relationship between the parties, etc. You kind of get the feel for where this is heading, and that is how much control does one party have over the other. Now, there are different kinds of business associates. Clearly, there are now, and it's important to understand the difference. You may have a whole set of business associates that do have access to PHI, obviously, because otherwise they wouldn't be business associates, but attorneys, accountants, <clears throat> some consultants where they have access to PHI to perform their business function, but they don't store or maintain PHI on behalf of the covered entity. Others clearly do store and maintain PHI, EHR vendors, storage companies, health information organizations, etc. So, you know, the million, $64 million question is how do you sort of resolve or treat these um, different kinds of business associates in a consistent way based on what they do on behalf of the covered entity. Well, what about the question of international business associates? Well, one thing is clear. International business associates are not, obviously, they're not obviously required to comply with U.S. law. But, here's the but, you can't outsource your liability under the regulations. So, an international business associate must be made to comply with U.S. law via the business associate contract. I think if you try to outsource your liability, you're going to have to have, if you're sharing PHI internationally, you're going to have to have contracts with these uh, business associates and you're going to have to uh, make them um, aware of U.S. law and that they are on the hook 
for complying with U.S. law. So the contract must have additional terms and conditions as well should for an international business associate dealing with such legal concepts as jurisdiction and venue. Okay, now we're going to discuss business associates and uh, various intersections between a, a, a business, the concept of a business associate and the security rule, the privacy rule, and the breach notification rule, or the concept of business associates interacting with the three-legged stool of uh, the High Tech Act container. So Section 13401 of the High Tech Act, Application of Security, provisions and penalties to business associates of covered entities. That really um, made business associates statutorily re required to comply with the security rule. Previously, um, business associates duties, duties and responsibilities were attached to the contract with the covered entity. High tech changed that. It, the, there are certain duties and responsibilities, terms and conditions, obviously, that still attach in the contract. But now business associates are liable statutorily for complying with the security rule. What sections? Well, section uh, 164.308, the administrative safeguards, 310, the physical safeguards, 312, the technical safeguards, and 316, policies and procedures. And uh, if you're familiar at all with the security rule, that really is the substantive part of the security rule. So it's not clear to me why HHS uh, just didn't say uh, you have to comply with the security rule in its entirety because pretty much that is uh, the meat and potatoes of the security rule. So now the security rule, keep in mind, only deals with electronic protected health information, whereas the privacy rule is really the 800-pound gorilla uh, in that it deals with uh, protected health information in, in any form or medium, paper, electronic, etc. So you can think of the security rule, uh, the PHI in the security rule being a subset of um, the, the entire universe of PHI that's covered by the privacy rule. So electronic protected health information means information that comes within paragraphs 1i or 1ii of the definition of protected health information as specified in this section. So these are uh, the highlighted sections transmitted by electronic media, maintained in electronic media. This is going to be much more than simple, uh, simply your uh, electronic health records, your practice management system, images on your uh, servers, uh, any kind of PDF documents that contain PHI. The world of uh, electronic PHI is obviously quite large and it, it, it and is encompasses a lot more than uh, database applications so what are the key objectives for covered entities and now business associates in complying with the security rule well the the key objectives as listed is to ensure the confidentiality integrity and availability of all ephi to protect to protect against any reasonably anticipated threats or hazard and those are terms of art that you're going to hear over and over again in the security rule reasonably anticipated threats to protect against reasonably anticipated uses or disclosure of ephi which essentially means uh violations of the privacy rule so to protect against reasonably anticipated uses or disclosures of ephi not permitted or required under the privacy rule and to ensure its workforce complies with the security rule. Those are the four key objectives um, as per the security rule for business associates and for covered entities that sort of should guide your security rule compliance uh, initiative. Now covered entities may use any security measures that allow the covered entity to reasonably and appropriately implement the standards. The security rule does not dictate or mandate that you implement any certain Technology it certainly uh, anticipates that you will uh, implement certain kinds of technology, but it doesn't mandate that you uh, implement any particular one uh, other than when it comes to encryption that we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. But if you're going to encrypt, you have to encrypt per HHS guidance if you want to take advantage of the encryption safe harbor for breach notification uh, 
but I should point out here that encryption is uh, recommended but not required by the security rule so you can be in compliance with the security rule without encryption but you can't take advantage of the safe harbor without encrypting in a manner as specified by HHS now the security rule contains this concept of of a flexibility approach principle factors that is intended to allow the security rule to scale from small practices to large I think in practice uh, it's debatable how much flexibility there is in the flexibility approach and we'll uh, talk a little bit about why that's the case but here are the here are the flexibility factors the size complexity and capabilities of the organization the organization's the organization's technical infrastructure hardware software security capabilities the cost of security measures to the organization and the probability and criticality of potential risks to EPHI now these are factors there, there are no bright line rules you know a thousand shades of gray and uh, for those reasons I don't believe that it really uh, provides the scalability from small practices to large as the um, as HHS may, may have anticipated but nonetheless those are the factors so what are the administrative safeguards administrative uh, are there uh, the administrative safeguards are administrative actions policies procedures to manage the selection development implementation and maintenance of security measures to protect EPHI you can think of the administrative safeguards as essentially defining your security rule implementation program okay it, it, it's the policies procedures etc that define the program that's what the uh, administrative safeguards contend can, can, um, are made up of they uh, the administrative safeguards are AS can take eight technical standards that we call technical standard and one business standard the administrative safeguards contain 18 implementation specifications and these 18 implementation specifications comprise over 50 percent of the security rules so if you're looking for a place to attack the rule this is obviously the place that you you need to start um, um, for a number of reasons one is that the risk analysis uh, and risk mitigation sort of exercise that you need to go through is foundational to the rest of the implementation of the security rule so by far our view is that the AS are, are the most important safeguards so the AS after implementation essentially defines your EPHI protection program failure to implement an effective risk management strategy which is the critical part of um, one of the AS standards okay uh, risk management and mitigation failure to implement could land you in, and likely will land you your organization in willful neglect land and again just as a reminder when you see a URL you can click through uh, to the HIPAA survival guide to get further information so the technical standards security management process implement policies and procedures to prevent detect contain and correct security violations you need a security incident management and tracking system in place that's an obvious audit point if you don't have that then obviously uh, how are you going to track breaches etc etc assign security responsibility someone within the organization needs to be identified as a security officer again that's a no-brainer you name someone give them the responsibility but you're going to have to give that person the budget and the organizational wherewithal i.e. power to implement what they need to implement otherwise um, the executives are going to be held accountable workforce security you need to implement policies and procedures to ensure that only appropriate members of the workforce have access to EPHI in many cases this is um, health information technology 101 you got to go through it you, you have to document it you make, make sure that you have a rigorous process in place and this is not a one-time event this is because the technology changes technologies involve threats uh, new threats appear this is an ongoing process uh, in order to maintain security rule compliance information access management implement policy and procedures for authorized access to EPHI security awareness and training obviously you need to train um, various staff personnel in different aspects of the security rule uh, how to report incidents 
what kind of passwords you should be using, et cetera, et cetera. Security incident procedures, implement policies and procedures to address uh, security incidents. This is really uh, the flip side of tracking. You got to have a place actually to capture an incident. Contingency plan, establish policies and procedures for responding to an emergency or other occurrence. What are you going to do if you get wiped out? You know, the, the, the essence here is how do you Katrina proof your practice if you're almost completely hosted on the cloud? You get wiped out, you drive three hours, get your laptop, you're back online. You know, that's part of your that's part of your contingency plan. And evaluation is this sort of sense of, you know, the security rule implementation is this continuing process that's evergreen. So you need to perform periodic technical and non-technical evaluations, and you definitely need to perform an evaluation anytime your operational environment changes. The business standard part of the AS, business associate contracts, we've talked about contracts uh, before. A covered entity in accordance with the general rule, 164.306, may permit a BA to create, receive, maintain, or transmit EPHI on a CE's behalf only if the CE obtains satisfactory assurances. That's a term of art that will probably likely um, someday soon be defined by the federal courts what that means but the satisfactory assurances is the language that says you have to do your due diligence with your business associate partners and your uh, business associates are going to have to do that with their subcontractors in accordance with 164.314 these assurances must be attained by way of a written contract that meets the requirements of both the security rule and the privacy rule and under the High Tech Act, BAs are now required to comply with the substance, substantive sections of the SR, those four that we covered, and all PR sections made applicable, applicable to the BA via the contract and made applicable via the High Tech Act, such as the breach notification requirements. So AS guidelines. The AS standards are process centric and therefore no commercial off-the-shelf product solves the problem by definition you can't outsource the implementation of the administrative standards this is something that is specific to your environment your organization it's really not technology based it's process based so there's no such thing as hipaa compliant products only covered entities and business associates that are compliant or not However, products may help organizations comply with a necessary but ultimately insufficient subset of the regulations, and those really are the regulations that are covered in the technical standards. Okay, so we're talking about the administrative standards, we're going to talk about technical standards, we're going to talk about the physical standards. There's technology and off-the-shelf products that can help you with the technical and the physical standards, the Administrative standards are really uh, the creation of documentation and processes where you have defined the program and how the program will be implemented. And by program, I mean your security rule implementation program. Now, although all of the administrative safeguard standards must be met and or reviewed, the first standard, risk analysis and management, is arguably the most important because it is foundational. Almost every other standard and administrative safeguards depends on it. Now, you know, the advice here is get traction, get started, and have a plan to build the rest. You, you're on the hook now if you're a business associate. Uh, you need to um, do this risk analysis and management. Covered entities obviously need to do it. And it is a, a uh, complex but very important undertaking where you're probably going to need some help in thinking through how to go about doing it because it's the most critical part of the security rule, your security rule implementation. The physical safeguards. Now, we're not covering the security rule in all its depth. We have security rule training that goes into that. So we are trying to give you a highlight of where business associates intersect with uh, the security rule and the privacy rule and the breach notification rule. So because 
business associates are required to comply with the security rule, they must implement the administrative safeguards, physical safeguards, technical safeguards. So what are the physical safeguards? They're physical measures, policies, and procedures to protect the covered entities, electronic information systems, and related buildings and equipment from natural environmental hazards, unauthorized intrusion, etc. The technical safeguards means the technology and the policies and, protect, uh, and procedures that protect EPHI and control access to it. So, um, strong passwords, automatic log offs, not storing uh, PHI locally on mobile devices. There's lots and lots of um, enabling technologies that can help you protect your EPHI, uh, bulletproof it to the degree possible. Here's a case in the technical safeguards and the physical safeguards where commercial off-the-shelf products are clearly um, going to be useful to the organization. The policies and procedures. So th the standard policies and procedures and implement reasonable and appropriate policies and procedures to comply with the standards, implementation specifications, or other requirements of this subpart get taken into account those factors specified in 164.306b. Yada, yada, yada. This standard is not to be construed to permit or excuse an action that violates any other standard, implementation, specification, or other requirements of this subpart. In other words, you got to rigorously go through the requirements of the security rule and document how you've implemented uh, the standards and how you've dealt with the recommended um implementation specifications in our security rule training we go into um, the fact that some standards are required okay and some standards are uh, some uh, specifications are required to implement some are addressable uh, and in either case you rigorously have to document how you went about uh, either implementing the specification implementing an alternative or providing at a minimum a compelling reason why you chose not to implement uh, that particular specification and uh, at the end of the day I think there's not going to be that many compelling reasons why you couldn't implement the specification either as written or via an alternative so you know we said that a security rule implementation is a continuous process we like to use this compliance continuum no story by no story we mean that essentially you're thumbing your nose at the law you haven't gotten started you haven't changed anything as a result of the high tech act which was really a transformative piece of legislation you still you still are dealing with uh hipaa prior to high tech then you're probably almost certainly in willful neglect land a good story means not not any sort of fabrication but the ability to get better over time at producing visible demonstrable evidence of compliance if you can consistently improve your ability to provide visible demonstrable evidence of compliance then you're on your way to being fully compliant which uh, in many cases if not all is this aspirational uh, goal so we like to use the compliance equation and as a way to indicate that really if you're going to uh, get on board with the new way of thinking about compliance, you're going to have to really change your compliance, uh, your organizational DNA, the way you think about compliance. Compliance is not this necessary evil add-on, ad hoc that you sort of get to after the fact that never has enough budget. You're not going to be able to comply in this new world that we now live in unless you make privacy and security a key part of your organization's uh, DNA and your organization's day-to-day -day operations. We think you have to have policies, you have to have organizational processes that underpin those policies, and you have to have tracking mechanisms to track process results. So you have to have a training policy, you have to have a training process or processes, and you have to have ability to track when you've trained your workforce according to the requirements. That is one example of policies plus processes plus tracking equals visible demonstrable evidence or VDE equals <coughs> establishing a culture of compliance over time.
We're now, we're now going to cover the intersection of business associates with the privacy rule. Uh, keep in mind that this is not complete privacy rule training. We have a privacy rule training with omnibus rule update training module that covers uh, the privacy rule in depth. Same thing with the security rule, same thing with the breach notification rule. But here we're trying to give you a feel for how business associates interact with these various rules. So Section 13404 of the High Tech Act, application of privacy provisions and penalties to business associates of covered entities. You're on the hook for what's in the contract. You're on the hook for breach notification. And you're on the hook for anything else of um, related to privacy um, that the High Tech Act specified. So 404A says that business associates must comply with the aspects of the privacy rule made applicable to them via the contract with the covered entity. 404B, business associates must be aware of the required contractual elements and must monitor the contract. So now we have this reciprocal monitoring for material breach between the covered entity and the business associate, between a business associate and a subcontractor, between a sub and a sub, lots of cooks in the kitchen monitoring contracts. 404C, BAs are directly on the hook for criminal and civil penalties under the High Tech Act. So under 164.504 E1 standard BA contracts of the privacy rule, the contract or other arrangement between the covered entity and the BA required under this section must meet the requirements of paragraph E2. There are certain uh, statutory regulatory requirements that has to be in the contract our model contract provides these but in addition <clears throat> you can think of this uh, BAA or business associate agreement as being a specialized contract that has certain statutory and regulatory requirements but beyond that it's a contract so the parties are free to do in that contract what they would normally be able to do in any other contract so a CE uh, as part of E1II, a CE is not in compliance with the standards in 502E in paragraph B of the section if the CE knew of a pattern of activity or practice of the BA that constituted a material breach. Okay, so essentially a covered entity is not allowed to look the other way, neither uh, a business associate. You have, to, you have to take certain specific action, uh, look to the omnibus rule update, but you have to take certain specific action if you find that the other party is uh, in material breach. And uh, the reporting to the, the the issue to the secretary has changed somewhat. Uh, it's covered more in some of our other training modules. Uh, and in some cases, the secretary says you don't have to report uh, with respect to a breach. I, I We think it's the best practice to report when you can't resolve a material contract issue with one of your business partners. Um, one uh, 504E2 implementation specification BA contracts establish the permitted and required uses and disclosures. So the uses and disclosures that are permitted or required of the business associate is going to depend on the function that the business, the business function that the business associate is performing on behalf of the covered entity. So the contract may permit the business associate to use and disclose PHI for the proper management and administration. Obviously, um, a business associate or subcontract wouldn't be able to perform that business function if it couldn't use the PHI for its own management and administration. The contract may permit uh, business associates to provide data aggregation services related to the healthcare operations uh, of the CE. <coughs> uh, provided that the business associate will A, not use or, or further disclose the information other than as permitted or required by the contractor as required by law. So uh, required by law would uh, implicate the privacy rule. You can't, a business associate is not going to be able to use and disclose information that it would be a violation for the covered entity to do. Uh, the business associate must use appropriate safeguards to prevent use or disclosure of the information other than as provided by its contract and other than as provided by statute now. A uh, business associate must report to the CE any, any use or disclosure of the information not provided for by its contract of which it becomes aware. These um, requirements now all likewise apply to subcontractors of 
business associates that are just a different, uh, not a different kind of business associate. They're really just business associates. The context is slightly different. Um, BA will ensure that any agents, including the subcontractor to whom it provides PHI, received from or created by or received by the BA on behalf of the CE, agrees to the same restrictions and conditions that apply to the BA. And the omnibus rule made that clear. The requirements that a covered entity puts in the, uh, the contract with its direct business associates must cascade down to all subsequent subcontractors. 504E2E, make available PHI in accordance to uh, 524. That's a patient's right to access PHI. Make available PHI for amendment. It's a patient's right to amend PHI. Make available the information required to provide an accounting of disclosures. That's 164.528. So the business associate that manages PHI on behalf of a covered entity inherits all these requirements that um, are part of the patient's Bill of Rights, what we like to call the Patient's Bill of Rights, are responsible for providing access. Now, historically, in the paper universe, there wasn't that many requests for access. That is quickly changing, and many business associates are probably going to be caught unawares as to the processes that they now have to have in place that they always needed to have in place, but really there was no, uh, no patients driving the use. Uh, business associates will make its internal practices, books, and records relating to the use and disclosure of PHI received from or created or received by the BA on behalf of the CE available to the secretary. We also, in our model contract, talk about making these pra practices, books, and records available to the CE upon request and upon sufficient notice so that a CE can perform uh, the necessary due diligence that it needs to do to get the satisfactory assurances that are required. So, uses of dis and disclosures of PHI. Uses and disclosure to individuals. A CE may disclose PHI to a patient and likewise to a health plan. A health plan can disclose PHI to an enrollee. You know, we're covering the basics here because these now apply to business associates. Again, if you want a, a more in-depth, rigorous treatment of the privacy rule, uh, then we would um, recommend that you go... And, and review our privacy rule training module. But common sense applications of the rules, providers can obviously talk to their patients, health plans can contact their enrollees. Common sense is in many ways a very good prism and baseline for understanding the privacy rule. The privacy rule provides for uses and disclosure to legal representatives. Obviously, if someone's incapacitated, if it's a child, then it's gonna be the legal representative that, uh, the, the covered entity, the provider can address uh, PHI concerns, questions, and the release of information too. A CE may use PHI to carry out essential healthcare functions for treatment, payment, and operations. Treatment means the provision, coordination, or management of healthcare by one or more providers. So obviously PHI is used every day, all day, 24 seven for treatment purposes. Payment. Payment means activities of providers to obtain payment or be reimbursed for their services or activities of health plans, etc. Covered entities and business associates can use PHI for the purposes of payment. Now, there is an exception uh, that was written into the Omnibus Rule and written into the High Tech Act uh, that you need to uh, pay special attention to, and that is the requirement that when a patient pays out of pocket in full, it has the right to request a restriction that that PHI not be forwarded to any other uh, covered entity, such as a uh, an insurance provider, okay? And covered entities are required to honor this restriction. So we would um, refer you to the omnibus rule training and the updated privacy rule training to get more detailed information about that particular restriction. That's why you see the orange hand here. That was changed in the omnibus rule. Operations means administrative, financial, legal, and quality improvement to things necessary to run your business. Obviously, you can use PHI to do that because it would be almost impossible to run a business uh, of a provider without it. So to summarize, PHI can be used for its own treatment payment operations. PHI can be used for treatment activities of another uh, 
covered entity and where we're saying covered entity here you can substitute business associate uh, and, and it works almost universally so PHI can be disclosed to another CE for the recipients payment activities PHI may be disclosed to another covered entity if a mutual relationship with the individual exists between the CEs or for other CE training or fraud abuse and detection activities <clears throat> voluntary consent by the individual with respect to uses and disclosure is permitted but you can't use voluntary consent where an authorization is required so authorization is really a, a term of art uh, in under the privacy rule requ requires um, requires it to be written certain formal steps need to be taken um, and so you know that's sort of a, a a special issue that was actually dealt with considerably in the omnibus rule and is covered in uh, our privacy rule training now with the omnibus rule update so the, here we're giving you the highlights individual author, authorization is required in certain cases author authorization is required and and one must be obtained and the use and disclosure must be consistent with the authorization so where you re, where one is required you have to have it, it has to be in writing and the use and disclosure by the covered entity or business associate must be consistent with what was authorized authorization is required for psychotherapy notes except in very limited circumstances authorization is required for marketing uh, and a valid authorization must contain certain core elements it's kind of like the business associate contracts it's not any old authorization with any old language it requires specific language now under uh, the omnibus rule authorization is required if a covered entity or business associate wants to sell it's PHI to a third party for marketing purposes. Uses and disclosure opportunity to agree or object. Uh, it's 164.510. A, a covered entity's facility directory in a hospital, uh, an individual gets to say yay or nay whether they want their uh, uh, name listed. If an individual is present uh, and there are other people in a room, for example, then you have to ask the individual whether you can disclose PHI in front of this particular group or whether they want the group to exit the room. So if under those circumstances that usually hop, happen in clinical settings, you, if the individual is present, the individual must be asked whether they agree or object that the PHI be disclosed with other people in the room. If the individual is not present or is incapacitated, the covered entity must use his or her professional judgment to disclose the limited amount of PHI to be used in the best interest of the individual. Here's some cases where there's no authorization required nor opportunity for the individual to object. We categorize these as public policy reasons when it's required by law, when it's required by public health activities, when it's required to report victims of abuse, neglect, or domestic violence, for health oversight activities, for judicial proceedings via a, a subpoena or other mechanism, request mechanism for law enforcement, other specific public policy reasons. The omnibus rule has now changed um, how covered entities need to provide or can provide uh, immunization records to schools. So that is something you would want to follow up on. Other uses and requirements under 164 by 14, 514 for uh, de-identification re-identification consistent with the minimum necessary principle which the HHS secretary is going to pro provide more uh, guidance on but essentially the, the uh, minimum necessary principle is a privacy principle that mandates that PHI uses and disclosure on a need to know basis with uses and disclosures limited to what is required to meet the designated purpose and distinctions can be made between routine and non-routine uses and disclosures and then uses and disclosure related to what's in the limited data set that's a term of art limited data sets uh, often remove certain uh, identifiers and uh, for research and their sharing agreements uh, that need to be established when you want to share limited data sets so uses and disclosures essentially the general rule in 502 a is the starting point if you want to determine whether or not there's been a violation of the privacy rule turns out that for many many reasons you're going to want to know uh, 
when the privacy rule has been violated. Uh, if you're going to sanction your employees, you need to specify how the privacy rule was violated. If there was a breach, then the privacy rule was violated by definition, and you're going to want to know and document how and what manner the privacy rule was uh, violated. And you would start with the general rule in 502A and go through these other sections, organizational requirements, TPO, did you have the authorization? Did you give the individual an opportunity to agree? Was an authorization requirement? That's how you would work through the privacy rule in order to determine whether or not it had been violated. So here are uh, the general rule summarized. This is 164.502A deals with permitted and required uses and disclosures, right? That's that list that we said you go through when you're trying to analyze if the privacy rule was violated. That is 164.502A. 502B deals with the minimum necessary principle. 502C, um, based on agreed restrictions with the individuals because the individuals are allowed to request restrictions. Uh, for the most part, covered entities uh, do not have to honor the restriction except for this one exception that was introduced under the omnibus rule uh, that some people call the self-pay uh, exception or restriction where an individual has paid in full for a particular service and and elect not to have PHI disclosed any further based on their full payment for that service. Uh, if you're looking for the standards for how to de-identify PHI, that would be in 502D. 502E, uh, as we discussed somewhat, deals with business associates. 502F deals with deceased individuals. 502G deals with personal representatives. So the general rule is really your key to unlocking the rest of uh, the privacy rule and really your key to understanding uh, the privacy rule. H has to do with confidential communications, uh, which is a whole subset of issues that come underneath that. Um, I has to do with uh, uses and disclosure consistent with the notice of privacy practices that you provided that uh, and that uh, that's, that section is 164.520 uh, and 502J has to do with how you handle uses and disclosures regarding whistleblowers. Okay, we're now going to talk about business associates. Um, in the intersection with the Patients' Bill of Rights, which is really a subset of uh, the privacy rules. So we talked about permitted uses and disclosure that ran from sections 164, 502 through 514. The Patients' Bill of Rights run from 164, 520 through 528. And finally, 530 is the administrative requirements. Now, Patients' Bill of Rights is what we call these sections. You won't hear that. Uh, anywhere else. HHS doesn't call it the Patients' Bill of Rights, so um, a word of note. So, Notice of Privacy Practices for PHI. It's 164.520. Now, um, there were changes having to do with authorizations. There were changes having to do with um, uh, other Notice of Privacy Practice concepts that required the redistribution of and and essentially uh, redrafting parts of your notice of privacy practices under the omnibus rule. That's covered in our privacy rule training uh, in more depth. And I just want to tell you that uh, uh, covered entities are going to need to issue new uh, privacy notice of privacy practices to any new patients going forward. Um, health plans are going to have to distribute a um, new notice of privacy practices to all their members. So 520A, right to notice, the use and disclosure of PHI with some exceptions for group, uh, for group uh, health plans and inmates. 520B, content of the notice, obviously the notice uh, has to have specific content. Required contents include a header, uh, users and disclosure examples, the individual's rights, covered entities' duties, duties processes regarding complaints, etc. Optional are, are limitations of users and disclosure that the CE has imposed on itself. Uh, 
as long as the use and disclosure is not required by law, uh, not required because of the individual's rights or the CE's duties. 520C, provision of notice. Uh, one thing to keep in mind as more and more providers are going online and creating patient portals that 520C requires a prominent display of your notice of privacy practices if you are engaged in the delivery of health services uh, online and that would be including uh, the fact that uh, you may be engaged in the delivery of services through your portal, through your EHR, uh, etc. You're going to need that notice of privacy practice practices prominently displayed so that first time patients can be aware of it um, in a similar fashion as they are today when they come to your office. 520D, joint notice by separate CEs is a special case. 520E, notice of documentation. You know you have to get the um, notice of privacy practices signed and filed. 522 has to do with restrictions of uses and disclosure. A covered entity must permit an individual to request restrictions uh, of uses and disclosures regarding treatment, payment, and operations. And disclosure is permitted under 510, which is the ability to agree uh, on, uh, or object. So you have to have a process in place to um, allow the request for restrictions. But a covered entity is not required to agree to a restriction, except as modified by 1305A of the High Tech Act, which is this payment, patient's payment in full for services that we talked about. That's a mandated restriction if a covered, if a patient requests that of a covered entity, the covered entity must comply uh, with that restriction. Otherwise, uh, the covered entity is not required to comply with prescription with with restrictions. It is required to have a process, but if a covered entity agrees to a, a restriction, it must honor it. I would recommend that you only comply with the restrictions that are required, absolutely required by law, which is this patient's payment in full for services, because uh, honoring a restriction means putting flags in the medical record and in other processes that you're not, uh, that you're not allowed to disclose this particular piece of information further and that uh, technically and otherwise probably gets to be a hard thing to do so as a as a practical matter uh, this uh, patient's payment in full for services restriction is going to be difficult enough to uh, to be able to track and implement so as a, as a general recommendation I would recommend that CEs not honor restriction except one an, uh, an exception basis. Um, restrictions and revocations of restrictions must be documented according to 164.530J. That's the general documentation administrative requirement. 522B, confidential communications. The covenant entity must accommodate reasonable requests for alternative methods of communicating PHI. And again, we're talking about business associates so where you see covered entity you can substitute business associate covered entity may require this request to be made in writing uh, our recommendation is that the these requests uh, are made in writing so that you have a record of the request in case there's some dispute later as to how the request was handled you have some uh, documentation as backup uh, a covered entity may not require or a business associate may not require an explanation for the request of an alternative communication method. So you can't grill the patient as to why they want, you know, uh, uh, you to communicate in a, in a particular way as long as it is a reasonable request. 524A, access to PHI, right to access, inspect and obtain copy of PHI and designated record set except for psychotherapy notes. PHI compiled for litigation and PHI accepted by a narrow, narrow set of certain legislative acts. You can go to 164.524 to get the details. Again, anywhere you see a URL, you can click through. Uh, and the reason we call this the uh, Patients' Bill of Rights is there's some due process-like considerations around a patient asking for a restriction or a patient asking for 
access and, and uh, certain timetables in, in which they, a business associate or covered entity have to uh, reply certain grounds for denial that are reviewable and unreviewable and one 64524A2 says unreviewable grounds for denial if accepted that means if, if, if there's an exception that applies if the covered entity is a correctional institution under certain research conditions and if PHI contained in records subject to the Privacy Act uh, this this is a narrow set so if you're gonna deny access to PHI uh, oh, I would say some huge percentage, 98% uh, uh, of those denials will be reviewable, will be reviewable by a third party. So a patient has the right to request your denial, that your denial be reviewed. So 164.524A34, some grounds for denial are reviewable as a matter of right. 524B, request for access and timely action, allow request, a CE must allow request for access, obviously, uh, that should go without saying, a covered entity must act on the request no later than 30 days after receipt, this is why you should have a formal process in place, access is in the document, that triggers calendaring of the 30 days, if request granted, then access must obviously follow, if request denied, then written denial must follow if PHI is not stored locally then CE has 30 days uh, to act 30 days um, is the rule now whether or not it's stored locally it used to be if this PHI was off-site you had 60 days HHS changed that in the omnibus rule whether it's stored locally or whether it's off-site the CE now has or the business associate now has 30 days to act a 30-day extension is available to the covered entity or the business associate if asked for in writing. So if you know you're not going to be able to meet your date, then you need to ask for that 30-day extension in writing. The covered entity must meet certain requirements regarding the form, format, and manner requested. I uh, suspect that most covered entities, especially mid-sized and smaller, do not have uh, well-defined processes regarding access, and this is one area uh, where they need to improve their privacy rule uh, implementation and the fee charge the fees charged for access are regulated and essentially nominal fees can be charged so denial of uh, access 524 D covered entity must provide other PHI that's outside of the bounds of the denial a written denial must be provided that meets certain requirements covered entity does not meet maintain if the covered entity does not maintain PHI in question but knows where it resides, it must inform the individual of PHI's location. If the individual has requested a review, then regulatory requirements for the review must be followed. Again, these are areas that are probably processes that are probably undefined or ill-defined because before the advent of electronic health records over the last three or four years, there simply were not a significant number of requests for access that is quickly changing. 524E says that documentation of a request for access must be kept as required by 530J. So what is going on here that is going to drive change? Well, the, you know, the High Tech Act itself is transformative, but there are other marketplace uh, trends going on, signaling that more and more patients will begin to leverage their HIPAA rights. First of all, baby boomers are about to retire in mass and are more computer computer literate by far than today's retirees that's going to drive requests for access second of all the rise of the quote-unquote engaged patient the e-patient the literate patient whatever you call the movement it's well established in growing people want access to their health records three higher quality healthcare information available on the internet will lead to more and more patients inquiring about their sy symptoms diagnosis diseases etc Baby boomers are going to have a lot of time on their hands. They are going to uh, do what they do today. They are going to search the internet for uh, answers that they can't otherwise get in the usual five-minute uh, or ten-minute uh, physician consultation, and they will return uh, with questions, that demands for access, etc. Uh, Signet will not be the last covered entity to get whacked for not delivering on patient 
access requests. Signet a couple of years ago got fined 14, not 14, I'm sorry, excuse me, $4.3 million for not honoring patient access requests. Essentially, um, Signet just summed their nose at, at these requests and, um, and got hit with a heavy fine. Right to amend PHI 164.526. Uh, there's a similar right to amend, just as there is the right to access. PHI and designated records set for as long as it's maintained. The C can deny an amendment only under a limited set of conditions. Uh, request to amend PHI in timely action. Covenant entity must allow such request to amend, but can ask for requests to be in writing. And again, we recommend that all these requests be in writing. The CE must allow, deny, request within 60 days. C and CE is entitled to ask for a 30-day extension again in writing. 526C, accepting the amendment. If the CE accepts the, uh, accepts the amendment, then the CE must notify, modify the uh, designated record set accordingly, notify the individual and notify others if required. 526D, denying the amendment. If the CE denies, then the CE must, one, provide a written denial, just like in the case of access, indicate that the individual has a right to offer a written response, indicate other rights of the individual regarding the detail, the, uh, the, the denial, including the right to file a complaint. CE has other rights and duties, including the right of rebuttal and duty to document. Again, this is a whole series of due process um, items, specifications, timetables that must be honored if you're going to comply with the patient's bill of rights. And uh, most BAs and covered entities probably are woefully, at this point, still behind the curve. Uh, because uh, we have yet to see uh, in mass, I, I believe, request for access. I think that that uh, is like a, a snowball uh, rolling downhill. It will gather uh, momentum over time, and you will see more and more requests and probably more and more fines issued related to not following the due process inherent in the patient's bill of rights. 526E, actions on notices of amendment. A CE that is notified by another CE of amendment must modify the designated record set accordingly. Documentation, again, a CE must document the titles of the person in receiving and process an amendment request. And so one obvious question from an auditor is, um, who, is processing, who is processing an amendment request? Uh, what's your policy around amendment requests? Show me your processes around amendment requests. Show me the titles of persons that deal with it, and obviously, if you don't have the appropriate answers, that's an easy uh, a ding on an audit. 528, uh, 164.528, accounting for disclosures, 528A, write to an accounting of disclosures PHI within six years prior to the date of, re of request, except PHI provided for treatment and payment uh, treatment payment or operations except note that tpo is not accepted for ce's with ehrs under the high tech act 13405 c1 so if you have um phi um, ephi in your electronic health record then you have to provide uh the phi and all the tpo um disclosures as well so as you might imagine you're going to need some technology help from your EHR vendor to help you comply uh, uh, with this requirement. So there's a right to an accounting of disclosure of PHI within six years prior to the date of the request, uh, except for uh, PHI provided for uh, in TPO to individuals, incident to, pursuant to an authorization, facilities, directory, national security, etc. So there are some exceptions. Again, I think by far uh, the exceptions are narrow, and a now that TB, TPO is included uh, uh, where electronic health records exist, there's just a, a, a significant amount of uh, PHI that has to be accounted for vis-a-vis -vis disclosures. Um, there can be a suspension of disclosures under certain uh, limited conditions, usually uh, by request of law enforcement. 528B, content of the accounting covered entity must provide 
a written, a written accounting that includes accounting of the disclosure for probably six years, including disclosures to business associates. Required elements such as date, person, entity that received the PHI, description of the PHI, and purpose of disclosure. This is a significant burden uh, to try to um, implement and, and to comply with without some technology help. And here's a case where technology will help if these um, if this functionality is not built into into your uh, EHR, you're going to have a difficult, difficult time complying with this kind of request um, manually. Multiple disclosures of the same person or entity may be summarized according to specific requirements. Research activities must be disclosed according to specific requirements as well. 528C, provisioning of disclosure. C must act on a request no later than 60 days. C may request an extension of 30 days in writing. Again, if you know you're not going to meet the date, then uh, the 30-day request uh, request for an extension maybe should just be a built-in part of your process. One accounting within a 12-month period must be provided at no charge. Thereafter, a reasonable cost may be charged provided advanced notice of fee is communicated. 528E, documentation, written accounting of what was provided and the titles and persons responsible for processing the request must be maintained. Okay, we're moving on to the breach notification rule. By now, it should be clear that the concept of a business associate significantly intersects with the privacy rule, with the security rule, and now we're going to discuss with how it intersects with the breach notification rule. And if you can recall back to the sections of the high tech, many of them had business associates um, in the title of the text. So uh, in order to entirely grasp the significance of the changes brought on by the new way that business associates are treated, you really need to dig into, uh, you need to have an overview such as this, but you also need to dig into uh, the individual training for the individual rules. So, High Tech Act Section 13402, notification in the case of breach, introduced the concept of breach notification, which before the High Tech Act did not exist uh, under HIPAA. 402A says that covered entities must notify individuals. 402B, business associates must notify covered entities. 402D, notification must be no later than 60 days after discovery. 402E, specific notification methods are required depending on the number of individuals whose PHI was breached. Breach notification in and of itself is a complex uh, topic. We have a breach notification framework that uh, provides the analytics uh, that will help you figure out when notification is triggered. Um, our model business associate contract requires a communications plan be developed between a business associate and a covered entity as part of the contract because if a breach occurs in an information system owned by the business associate then it's going to be the business associate that has to provide the covered entity with uh, many if not all of the details regarding the breach and so there is um, um, a lot of ground to cover around notification here we're just hitting the highlights. 402F, the notification must contain specific content. So like uh, business associate contracts, like authorizations, there are statutory requirements of what should be in the content, um, in the notification content. 402H says unsecured PHI means PHI that's not secured through encryption and or destruction methodologies and protocols as provided by HHA HHS guidance in the interim final rules. So if you are encrypting as per the guidance and those methods do render PHI and, and, and the ones that HHS recommended do render PHI unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable to unauthorized individuals, then there is no breach by definition and you sort of avoid, you take advantage of the safe harbor and you uh, 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 entirely avoid 
uh, the breach problem. The, uh, the challenge is, is that because there's just so much paper PHI that remains and even um, a great amount of electronic PHI that will not be completely encrypted uh, anytime soon, we're going to live in this hybrid environment where some PHI is encrypted, some PHI is not encrypted, and, and the covered entity or business associate is going to have to track uh, which is which for the purpose of uh, breach notification. So notification in the case of breach, if PHI is secured, as per the guidance, then providers have the safe harbor and the notification requirements are not triggered in the case of breach by definition. Okay, despite the safe harbor, other federal and state PHI laws remain full force in effect. Um, the definition of breach changed under the omnibus rule. What changed really was uh, uh, the risk of harm analysis has now been uh, replaced with a uh, risk assessment to determine whether there's been a low probability, whether there was a low probability that the PHI in question was compromised uh, as opposed to the risk of financial or other harm uh, to the individual. So uh, the, base, the base definition of breach remains the unauthorized acquisition, access, use, or disclosure of PHI, which compromises the security or privacy of such information, except where an authorized person to whom such information is disclosed would not be able to retain such information. There's really, that's really a dense definition. You have to parse it in order to get at what what uh, is actually being said and uh, break it down. So uh, determining when breach notification is triggered, we've developed um, an analytical framework around these steps. Uh, step number one is, was there an impermissible user disclosure of unsecured PHI? We talked about what unsecured PHI means. Impermissible user disclosure essentially means, was there a violation of the privacy rule? And we talked about uh, 164.502A and how you walk through the privacy rule to try to determine whether or not there's been a violation. If there's been no violation of the privacy rule, then there can't be a breach by definition. Uh, second, if you determine that there was unsecured PHI and the privacy rule was violated, you need to determine does an exception to the breach rules apply. There are actually three exceptions built into the definition of breach itself. Okay, if you determine that one of the uh, exceptions apply, then it's not a breach by definition. And essentially, that's an exercise of taking your, your facts uh, and comparing it to the hypotheticals presented uh, in the definitions of the of the exceptions in the definition of breach, if they match, uh, then you can uh, claim that one of the exceptions apply and it's not a breach. Finally, uh, if no exception applies, you need to determine was there a low probability that the PHI uh, was compromised, and that is the significant change to the breach notification framework. It removes the more subjective risk of harm to the individual. We've modified our breach notification framework to cover that, uh, as well uh, as well as uh, the rest of the changes that were introduced by the omnibus rule. So uh, here under the omnibus rule, you have a subcontractor of a BA would have to notify its BA. The BA notifies the CE. The CE notifies the patient always, uh, even if it was just one patient record that was compromised. Uh, it always uh, notifies HHS if it's over 500 records. It's going to, it's going to in, in, in aggregate, it's going to notify HHS right away within 60 days. Uh, but any breach, uh, even of less than 500 records, uh, HHS has to be notified at the end of the calendar year plus 60 days. Major media has to be notified uh, in certain cases as well. So there's definitely some very specific requirements regarding when and how notification is performed. Uh, so providing notification to uh, according to applicable law, uh, we have a set of uh, flow charts that we go through in our framework uh, based on, on the regulatory requirements. If you have contact information out of date for greater than 10 individuals, then you have to use substitute notice, website homepage, or major print or broadcast media, and a toll-free number. If you have out of date uh, information from less than 10 individuals, your substitute notice can be comprised of... Uh, written notice or telephone or other means and a toll-free number um, obviously if your contact information is completely accurate then you can notify via first class mail uh, and email if email was agreed to by the individual <clears throat> if greater than 500 
individuals in a state or jurisdiction uh, were compromised, greater than 500 records, then you have to uh, provide notice to prominent media outlets serving the state or jurisdiction. And depending on where the individuals live within the state, you may have to notify more than one major media outlet. Uh, if, if it's less than 500, 500 or less, then no media notification is required. Now, this means that if you had um, 200, if you had operations in New Jersey and New York and you had 200 uh, records compromised in, in Jersey and 400 in New York, you don't have greater than 500 in any single jurisdiction or state. Therefore, media uh, would not have to be notified. Now, that is different then notification immediately to HHS because uh, if you have greater than or equal to 500 individuals or records compromised in aggregate across states or jurisdictions, then notice to HHS required without unreasonable delay and in no case later than 60 days. Okay, if it's less than that, notice to HHS no later than 60 days past the end of the year. So clearly you need to have a breach notification plan in place all the way from tracking security incidents to the analytics that you go through to determine if it's triggered and if it is triggered what are the requirements and how do we do this according to applicable law and this is going to uh, in information systems controlled by business associates or subcontractors require a lot of communications between the entities because at the end of the day it is the covered entity that's responsible for the notification. So to summarize, what uh, what should be contained in the notification to the individual? A description of what happened, a description of the types of unsecured protected uh, health information uh, that were involved in the breach, any steps individuals should take to protect themselves, a brief description of what you're doing to, to investigate the breach, and contact procedures for individuals to ask questions or learn additional information, which must include a toll-free number, an email address, website, uh, et cetera. So you're gonna to wanna to be as transparent as you can possibly be during the notification process. We talked about uh, unsecured PHI. If the PHI is secured according to the guidance, it turns out that that question is not so easily answered because the, the way you secure PHI is different for PHI at rest. PHI in motion, PHI disposed, uh, PHI in use. So you're going to have to determine the state of the, that the PHI was in uh, in order to determine if it had been encrypted according to the guidance. Uh, 13408, business associate contracts required for certain entities. Uh, which entities? Those that provide data transmission of PHI. This is really the interoperability organizations, health information exchanges, uh, the HIEs, regional health information organizations, the RHIOs, e-prescribing gateways, essentially vendors that contract with the CE or and vendors that contract with the CE to offer their PHR as part of the CE's EHR. That was the example of Microsoft Health Vault, PHR being connected to the covered entities EHR. In that case, uh, Microsoft Health Vault would be a business associate of the covered entity um, if if Microsoft is making its personal health record application available directly to consumers uh, and is not tied to the EHR recovery entity, then obviously that it, it, it's, it is not, a uh, in that case, a business associate of the covered entity. 13409, uh, clarification of application of wrongful disclosure, criminal penalties. Um, we're not going to spend too much time here, but the enforcement rule has been dramatically enhanced. High tech put a lot of teeth in, in, in HIPAA that were uh, previously not available. And for many, many different reasons, we're going to see uh, increased enforcement actions. We just live in a totally different uh, electronic world than we did even a few years ago. 13410 improved enforcement. Um, Essentially, more tools are, are available now, more enforcement tools are available. Uh, the concept of willful neglect was introduced, and willful neglect means conscious intentional failure, or you can think of it as reckless indifference to the obligation to comply with the administrative simplification provision violated. Reckless indifference essentially means thumbing your nose at the law, not having done anything since the High Tech Act was promulgated. 
uh, that will probably uh, get you into willful neglect land. So you're not going to be able to uh, get by with just dusting off those old HIPAA uh, policies and procedures that you implemented five or six years ago. That is not uh, going to get the job done. So what is willful neglect? Well, ultimately, um, it, it'll be a court of law um, or HHS on a case-by-case -case basis that decides what willful neglect is we're going to give you some sort of rules of thumb all you have are legal documents or manuals for patients and or business associates to sign without any underlying processes that support this, the document so if all if all you have is policies with a bunch of flowery language in it about what the organization intends to do but no evidence that the organization ever implemented processes or tracking mechanisms you're probably in willful neglect if you have legal documents, but they, didn't, they do not meet the specific requirements contained in the regulations, your notice of privacy practices, uh, practices for example, now does not comply with the omnibus rule. Your authorizations don't comply with the, um, with the requirements. Your business associate contract lack the statutory requirements. Uh, that's probably going to land you in willful neglect land. You have no visible demonstrable evidence that you are either in compliance or making a serious attempt at compliance. Uh, for example, training your staff as required by the statute or regulations. And remember, visible demonstrable evidence goes back to our compliance equation. The equation, you not only have to have policies, you have to have processes that underpin the policies, and you have to have tracking me mechanisms that track process results. Uh, you're probably going to be in willful neglect if you have no plan to show how you are working on full compliance. So if you can make a good faith argument that you've gotten started, that you haven't thumbed your nose at the law, that you've done X, Y, and Z, and you have the remainder to do, but you have a plan, you may uh, get by with uh, perhaps a slap on the wrist and, and be able to avoid a finding of willful neglect. 13411 calls for audits. B business associates, covered entities, both can be audited. Uh, HHS has already run a test audit program with KPMG where 150 uh, covered entities were audited. Um, no business associates were audited as part of that, but business associates are clearly uh, uh, were intended to be part of uh, the entities that were edited under 13411 of the High Tech Act. Um, says the secretary shall provide for periodic audits to ensure that covered entities and business associates that are subject to the requirements of the subtitle and sub part C, the HIPAA security rule, and E, the HIPAA privacy rule of 164 Title 405 CFR, as such provisions are in effect, etc., etc., etc. So audits are mandated. HHS uh, has to come up with a methodology on how these audits are, are going to proceed, probably some sort of random statistical uh, selection, uh, such as employed by the IRS when determining who to audit, uh, that me the methodology um, clearly probably will not be made public as to how that's going to work. Uh, and um, um, as far as we know, HHS has not articulated what that methodology, even that it's that it's uh, as of yet developed the methodology. Uh, the High Tech Act introduced fine, uh, far stiffer fines. Uh, we are highlighting here, uh, it's got four different levels. Level C and D are willful neglect levels. Uh, level uh, C is willful neglect that was found by the organization, found by the covered entity or business associate, and cured without outside in, uh, agency intervention, cured by the entity itself within 30 days. Those fines... Uh, start at uh, $10,000 and can go up to $250,000 yearly cap uh, per identical violation. Uh, and yearly cap for all identical violations is a million five. So um, far stiffer. I can tell you what under HIPAA, $25,000 was the maximum uh, fine that could be levied. levied uh, Level D is a willful neglect without being cured within 30 days. And again, 150 uh, yearly cap per identical violation, yearly cap for all identical violations. Uh, there is some um, um, discussion whether or not uh, the million five is a maximum uh, 
level. Um, I, I think the better interpretation is it's the maximum level per identical violation. Um, and, and so the, you know, there's likely no theoretical max as to the, the fine that could be levied. And we saw that Signet got uh, hit with a $4.3 million fine. Uh, along with the tiers or basic uh, or some degrees of fault, um, reasonable cause, reasonable diligence, willful neglect, um, they're escalating in nature. By the time that you're having to deal with these tiers, you probably have counsel ad advising you. The takeaway, uh, the takeaway here is that the penalties under high tech have gotten um, stiffer. The enforcement regime is going to be um, far more aggressive. State AGs can bring suits. Uh, patients will um, eventually be able to participate in the proceeds from fines. The fines themselves have been uh, mandated to go back to HHS coffers to fund more enforcement. Uh, and there's just lots and lots of reasons why uh, we believe you're going to see enhanced enforcement uh, going forward. So we're going to now move on to business associate contracts and cover some details here. They've always been required. They now require reciprocal monitoring on the part of the BA and the CE under the High Tech Act. Under the High Tech Act and the HHS Omnibus Rule, subcontractors or BAs will be treated as business associate. That was now clarified under the omnibus rule. Uh, and a business associate contract will be required between a BA and its subcontractor. Because of the breach notification rule and other high tech act provisions, there should be additional terms and conditions incorporated into the business associate agreement. One example uh, that, that we include in our model contract is that a communications plan be developed in the case of breach so that uh, the point persons, point persons on, in both organizations are identified, uh, the format of the electronic uh, PHI, how it will be transferred, is defined, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we're now going to move on to business associate omnibus rule summary just to pull it all together, how the business, uh, the concept of business associate was impacted by the omnibus rule. It's obviously... Um, uh, made a huge difference, and that was part of the intent of the High Tech Act. If you go back again and you look at how many sections of the High Tech Act had business associate in them, the the, the um, business associate concept is really having a broad and deep impact on uh, the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. So the omnibus rule adopts as business associate those identified as such, in High Tech Act Section 13408, we've already covered this, HIEs, RHIOs, e-prescribing uh, gateways, those are all business associates by definition. The conduit exception still applies, but is limited to an organization that merely transmits PHI, for example, an ISP, as opposed to those organizations that maintain and store it, for example, a record storage company or a cloud EHR vendor. The former is not a business associate, but the latter is. Omnibus rule clarified that subcontractors that create, receive, maintain, or transmit PHI on behalf of a BA, they're HIPAA BAs as well, and therefore on the hook for compliance with applicable rules in general, the breach notification rule, the HIPAA security rule, HIPAA privacy rule, the enforcement rule, etc. Some exceptions. In general, to who's a BA? In general, a person or entity is a business associate only in cases where the person or entity is conducting a function or activity regulated by the HIPAA rules and on behalf of a covered entity. So you may, there may be instances where you're dealing with PHI for a certain business function, but you are not doing it on behalf of a covered entity. In that case, you would not be uh, a business associate under the rules. Uh, two, a person or entity who may view PHI and we talked about this incident to the business function performed on behalf of the CE or BA. is not a BA. We talked about janitorial services, landscapers, etc. Finally, an exception is a person or entity who only serves as a conduit. That's the conduit exception. Your ISP 
your wireless service providers are not BAs by definition. We're not going to turn it over to Q&A. Thanks for listening. It's been my pleasure being with you today.